Okay, besides arguments between Skinner and Chomsky, how do we know that you need cognition to understand human thought? Well, we're going to talk about three classic studies um, that show that stimulus and response is not going to be sufficient to explain how you think. All right, the first one is going to require you to participate. Now, you're going to find out later in the semester that your memory is best for things that you actually do. So if you do this demonstration, you won't have to study as long later. If you don't do the demonstration, if you just sit there, you're not, you will have to study later. So I strongly urge you, try to do this task, okay? All right. So this is going to be a classic study on the impact of meaning in memory. What I'm going to do here in a second is I'm going to read you a list of words and as soon as I'm done I want you to write down that list of words. You can type it, you can write it on a post-it note or the back of an envelope, it doesn't matter, but I'm going to read you a list of words and when I'm done I want you to write down what those words were. You ready? You got a piece of paper or something to type on? All right, here we go. Here's a list of words. Ready? Giraffe. Amos, milkman, eggplant, baboon, Gerard, parsnip, typist. Go. Write them down. I'll wait. Should we write down all the words you could remember? If you haven't yet, hit pause. If you have, then I want you to check your work against this slide that comes up. Now, on the left is the order in which I actually read the words. On the right is the order in which people typically recall the words. Notice that people are recalling the words in a different order than the order in which they heard or saw the words. Um, why is that? Well, notice that animals tend to be grouped together and plants tend to be grouped together and jobs tend to be grouped together. I know these are old fashioned jobs. Um, it was an old fashioned study, so I took the stimuli from the original study. Um, it turns out that people naturally, when they try to remember things, use meaning to help them. So they naturally group by meaning. Um, and that's why we reorganize uh, lists that we remember. We don't remember exactly what we saw or heard. What we remember is the meaningful interpretation of those stimuli. So behaviorism can't explain that. Behaviorism says you should reproduce whatever you were reinforced to do. Didn't happen here. Instead, memory for this list of words was shaped by meaning. Okay. Here's another one where I hope you can, you're in a place where you can talk out loud. Because it's a great demo, you're gonna to wanna to use this with, with friends. It's called the Stroop Effect. And let's um, just do it first. Now, what I'm, there you see on this grid a set of words that have different colors. What I want you to do, I do not want you to read the words. What I want you to do is to say the color of the ink. So don't read, say the color of the ink. You ready? I'll go with you. Red, green, blue, yellow, pink, orange, blue, green, blue, white, green, yellow, orange, blue, white. See how easy that is? I just read right along. Now we're going to do exactly the same thing. Read the color of the ink, not the word, and let's see what happens. Okay? So join in with me so I don't feel like a fool doing this by myself. So here we go. The color of the ink, not the word. Green, yellow, white, pink, orange, blue, red, yellow, green, blue, red, blue, green, red, pink, blue, <laughs> red, no, darn it, yellow, pink, Green, orange, red, blue, orange, red, green. See how hard that was? Same task, 
But in one case, in the first case, it was really easy. When the ink of, when the, the color of the ink is the same as the name of the word written out, we have no trouble reading or telling, saying what the color of the ink was. But when there's a mismatch, when the word is different, says a different color than the color of the ink, you saw all the stumbling I did. That's the Stroop effect. Um, and the Stroop effect is important because it tells us that something is happening here. There's an interference. And what's happening is, um, it's if you are an expert reader, and everybody in college is an expert reader, it turns out you can't stop yourself from reading something. So even though I told you, just tell me the color of the ink, you didn't do that. Um, well, you tried to, I tried to, just say the color of the ink. The problem was I couldn't stop myself from reading the words. So one part of my brain is reading the word and the word says red, and another part of my brain is trying to focus on the color of the ink, and the ink is blue, and so I've got these two things going on and I've got to keep my brain, keep them separated, just focus on the right one. That's confusion, right? The automaticity of reading is what accounts for this effect. So, for example, if you do the Stroop effect in a language that you don't know how to read, if you, if you redo the task where there's a mismatch, you won't have any trouble doing the task. If you use young kids who don't know how to read well yet, they don't stumble in the same conditions that expert readers stumble. There's automaticity of reading. We can't shut that down. Um, that automaticity is a mental process and you cannot explain it using behaviorism. Mental process. In cognitive psychology, mental processes exist and we can study them scientifically. The third experiment that I want to tell you about um, that supports the, the need for cognition is something called latent learning. Now, latent learning means even when you're not a, intending to learn something, you still learn from it anyway. Um, behaviorism is the opposite of that. Behaviorism says you only learn what you are reinforced for learning or punished for learning. But latent learning is maybe we're constantly learning and actively learning. And the, the fellow picture here, Tolman, um, set out to test that idea. Um, he wanted to know, would learning occur in the absence of reinforcement? And so he ran this famous study on something that we call mental maps. Now, if you guys have all been to the CSUN campus, so you can imagine walking around the campus. You can imagine being at Sierra Hall and walking to the library. Now, nobody reinforced you for learning that layout of campus in your head, right? Nobody was standing at the library giving you a candy. You could say, well, the fact that you got to the library is reinforcement itself, but you learned all the places in between too. You learned where there's a nice bench that actually has some shade. So um, I want you to imagine wherever you're seated now, which way you'd have to go to the nearest bus stop or your car. For me, it'd be that way. Um, imagine where is the nearest grocery store? For me, it's this way. I know in my head, I have a mental map of the world, of my world, in my head. So what Tolman wanted to do, or what Tolman did, is take a little mouse and put the mouse in a maze and just let it run around. Just like you and I run around campus with no particular goal in mind. And the question is, as the mouse is running around, is it learning its environment, even if it's not being reinforced for doing so? So Tolman came up with these complicated mazes and he let the mouse run around um, in the beginning and with no reinforcement and then later he put a little piece of cheese on one end of the um, maze. So imagine if somebody walked up and put a bucket of money on out in front of Oviat Library. Okay so you've been exploring campus now all of a sudden there's a bucket of money at Oviat Library. When you fumble along and find that bucket of money, 
What's going to happen? Well, the next time you get on campus, you're going right back for that bucket of money. This is what rats do. They are faster at finding where the mouse is. <laughs> Wrong. They're faster at figuring out where the cheese is. If they've had prior experience running around the maze, even if they weren't reinforced for doing so. In other words, you actively learn without reinforcement. And that's a problem for behaviorism. It's not a problem for cognitive psychology. Latent learning, unconscious learning is something we're going to study. Okay, let's end lecture 2.2 there. And we're going to come back for 2.3 where I'll talk about cognitive science.